Hi, my name is Frank Caruffi Jr. and welcome to the Crohn's Colitis Effect, uh, IBD Roundtable Episode 8. Uh, this uh, episode we're going <laughs> to... This episode we're going to talk all about diets and the psychology of eating. I can't wait um, to get this going. We, we've got a great panel once again and um, I just know that this is, uh, is going to be a very informative show. Um, so let's get started. Uh, why don't we... Uh, why don't we hear from our panelists? Um, Christina, you want to start? Yes, as I'm trying to fix whatever I did wrong because Google <laughs> doesn't two like of me you. tonight. There's two faces. Yes, I got thrown off when I. Uh, it's too much my... beauty. Too much beauty. <laughs> yep, it was overload. My name is Christina Matthies. I will soon have that at the bottom of the screen. I, uh, my website is livingsick.org and I co-manage the Crohn's and ulcerative colitis diaries with the lovely Marissa who's joining us tonight which is so exciting. So you can also find me on Twitter at Crohn's Diaries but again um, my page is livingsick.org which is my blog. Hello. Marissa? Mm -hmm. I am Marissa Troy. I'm really excited to be here tonight with all of you. Um, I co-manage the page, like Christina said, um, the Crohn's and Ulcerative Colitis Diaries, Living with IBD. I also write the blog, Keeping Things Inside is Bad for My Health, at wordpress.com. Um, I'm also on the board of the Intense Intestines Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping those people with Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and ostomies. Awesome. Um, Sarah Ringer. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah. I hope all of you are doing well tonight. I write the blog Inflamed and Untamed that you can find at inflamedanduntamed.com and from there you can get to my YouTube channel because I think that I am most well known for my YouTube videos about Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and you can also get to my Facebook fan page, my Instagram, Twitter and all the other stuff so inflamedanduntamed.com and I'm gonna pop out for a second and I'll be back. I have a little lag here. Okay. Um, uh, Sarah C. Hey everyone, my name is Sarah Schwery and I am the founder of the Crohn's Journey Foundation uh, where we host retreats and provide support to find an East and West bonds to find health, whole body and mind. A lot of times there's a lot of focus on East, uh, Western medicine so I'm kind of the Eastern medicine side of all the IBD world. That's awesome. And in a second, we're going to get to Nisha, who is uh, really, I'm really excited that she's here with us tonight. Um, she's going to fill us in on um, who she is, uh, what she does, and, um, you know, everything that we really do about, um, about uh, diets and the psychology of eating. But before we get to that, I just want to do two things real quick. I want to, um, I want to first dedicate this show tonight. Um, I've never done that before, but I want to dedicate the show to um, Carrie Jacobs, uh, her husband and her two children. Uh, for those of you that don't know, um, Carrie Jacobs uh, was somebody that um, a lot of us knew from the, uh, from the Facebook support group IBD Journeys. Um, she was a warrior, a battle, uh, someone who battled IBD. Um, she was only 35 years old, and unfortunately, um, a week ago, uh, she um, she passed away uh, due to complications of IBD. Um, you know, I don't ever, uh, I don't ever try to, I don't know, I don't try to ever be negative. Uh, I try my hardest mm -hmm. to be as positive as I can. But the reality of this is that um, people can succumb to IBD, and if um, if you don't know that, you should know that um, it's serious. And unfortunately, um, her two young children and her husband and the rest of her family, unfortunately, uh, is without her now, and it's a shame. And it shouldn't be. And uh, we need to do something to change that. And hopefully, uh, things like this, the roundtable, um, and all the wonderful advocacy that our panelists here do, along with so many other people, um, will help change that a lot. 
Um, the next thing I like to do is just ask you if you would please um, head on over to YouTube. Inside the Google Plus event page, you'll see that I posted links to our YouTube channel and also our um, iTunes where you can subscribe to us. Please do me a favor, go over there and subscribe. Um, right now I've got 168 subscribers. Love to see that get up to 200. Um, so if you go over there and subscribe, I appreciate it. The next thing I like to do is I like to give Christina Matthews just a few minutes um, to talk here for uh, for a second um, about her uh, her current health status and um, some new lung issues that you're experiencing. Yes, I think um, my lungs hate me and Google hates me because the the toolbox is not working for me. But uh, I've been blogging about it. I when I went into the hospital in June for a Crohn's flare that would not calm down I basically have a chronic narrowing that became just very inflamed and I couldn't get it under control so I went into the hospital and when they take the CT of your abdomen they catch the bottom of your lungs and they found a node in my lungs and you know it could mean all sorts of things and an ER doc woke me up and said you know you have a node in your lungs you have to follow up in six or three months to make sure you know it's not growing and then I said well what does that mean and he said um, I'm just supposed to tell you and then he walked out mm -hmm. and I was like okay That's thanks nice. for that now I've got yeah. some other things to worry about and I tried to put it out of my mind I was pretty successful and then when I went for my CT, you know, I've been through so much and I thought that this would be okay, that it would come back pretty clear. And I kind of put it out of my mind again, but my doctor called me and she said that I did um, what's called ground glass opacity, opacities throughout both lungs and that the node had actually gotten smaller but left scarring behind and it could be anything from cancer to one of those very awful infections that you know the black box warning on Crohn, on Humira and Remicade and other Crohn's medications where other people can be exposed to a certain fungus or certain mycobacteria which is in the same class as tuberculosis and they just cough it out and it's not a problem whereas people who are on Humira or Simzia or Remicade um, it stays in there and it creates an infection that's of the same family as tuberculosis and it can cause the same symptoms although you cannot spread it so that was the main concern I went through a bronchoscopy and that was another scope you know I felt like I made a joke one of the IBD tables that I'm the queen of scopes but I had no idea that I was going to get scoped in my lungs mm -hmm. and in fact my GI made a joke he said oh yeah they use the scopes the wrong way <laughs> and um but she said it was basically in inconclusive so I knew this was going to happen we all know I'm sure everyone on this panel has had a moment where a doctor has kind of shrugged their shoulders and said oops sorry I can't give you an answer right now you're just gonna have to wait but um, the cultures came back negative so thankfully I don't have a mycobacteria or a fungal infection she thinks that it is inflammation from Crohn's in my lungs which is apparently pretty rare like a point zero two percent of the population lungs your lungs become involved and from what I've been reading it looks like prednisone is the typical way to treat that but yeah. she did not biopsy me because she didn't want to introduce a site that could become infected so I might have to undergo another bronchoscopy to actually prove that it is Crohn's so I'm kind of in limbo right now but it's made me um, even more you know motivated to really talk about how Crohn's affects all of us in very different organs and even though you know AIDS is super serious and it kind of reminds me though that a lot of people who do succumb to Crohn's like Frank said usually have something else happen to them it's either a heart attack a blood clot 
um, surgical complications. It's never directly due to Crohn's and I think it's so very important for everyone to make sure that they have a great family doctor or internist and you're following every part of your body. You know, you women, I, I am particularly guilty of this. I need to have a uh, mammogram to get a baseline because the medications you're on increase your risk of all types of cancers. So this to me I'm trying to think of as an educational experience but like my mother-in-law said, she put it, she goes, I noticed one thing about you, you freak out, then you research and then you come up with a plan and I feel like I'm already in my plan phase. So I'm ready to get back there and, and make some plans and you know I'll be keeping everybody updated through my blog which is supposed to say at livingsick.org beneath me. So that's my current messed up, my jacked up lungs, as I like to say. Well, uh, first of all, of course, we're going to be thinking about you, praying for you, and, you know, hopefully that it is something as easy as, you know, just a, a course of prednisone to, um, you know, fix what's going on. Um, Thanks. But you're right. I, I, I definitely 100% agree with you that, unfortunately, um, you can't ignore any other possibilities. Um, mm -hmm. Fistulas, um, you know, are it, fistulas were my understanding were part of the complications. Uh, I don't know the entire story, but fistulas played a part in um, Carrie's passing. So um, everything is serious when when you have IBD. There is no such thing as well, you know, my blood pressure is a little high, so but it's nothing compared to uh, you know the IBD. Um, it just simply should not and cannot work that way. Um, you have to, you know, make sure that you're on top of everything. And um, seeing more doctors, <laughs> it's yeah. you, you spend half your life at doctors, but um, and it's never fun to have to add another one to the list. But don't don't take that chance. Don't wait. And on that. I know that this bothers a lot of people. You know, I'm not going to talk about Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. I, I know that there's problems with it and I understand that and I'm not, I'm totally apolitical when it comes to um, talking about Crohn's, but I feel very strongly that healthcare has to change because I luckily have insurance. I was able to go to the hospital, I was able to get the CT scan. Other people who, like you pointed out, Frank, have these fistulas forming inside of them and I've heard that fistulas can actually lead to your lungs as well. You know, if they're if they do not have insurance or money, then their life is no uh, less important than mine. And it I think that this does have to change in our country and whether the Affordable Care Act is a big start or whether it's a big screw up at least the dialogue is open on a lot of these things and I truly believe that you know if I can work towards something it would be to make sure that every single Crohn's and colitis person has access to the tests that they need. I don't think that there's anybody um, I, I would I would tend to believe that there is nobody in this country regardless of whether they're for or against Obamacare, um, Affordable Care Act, that um, would disagree with what you just said. It's not about politics. It's not about um, you know one thing or another. It's about making sure that um, everybody has access to the tests and the medications that they need. Um, you know, unfortunately, we have a hard time in this country figuring out how we're going to get to that place. But the 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 underlining thing has to be that everybody is afforded the ability to have health care. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think we're going to move on if, uh, unless you have anything else that you want to add to that, Christina. No, you gave me my time to talk a lot and slow. <laughs> I tried to speed up like a Yankee. I tried it. <laughs> you did better than most months. Um, <laughs> oh, thanks. You're welcome. An and underhanded just like, compliment. You know, um, Pearl Rotter and Holly, I'm so sorry, I'm going to butcher your last name, but I believe is uh, Gubish um, says that uh, they love you both and they um, they give you hugs and I'm sure they're thank sending you nothing. Thank you guys, I can't see your comments tonight, but thank you so much. Yeah, hey, unfortunately, 
unfortunately, there's there's a little bit of a problem for the rest of the panelists to see um, anything that's posted. I can still see everything. That's all that really matters. <laughs> um, so, so I will uh, I will uh, I will interject them as they as they come in. Um, but now on for our main event. I'm so happy that. Mm -hmm. Nisha is here with us, and Nisha, would you please do us a favor and um, let us know? First of all, I want to say that I want to thank Sarah C. Um, it's uh, Nisha and Sarah C. are mm -hmm. friends, uh, not just through the internet, but um, also in real life, as uh, we like to say. And um, Sarah C. came. I have met two Sarah C. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm sorry, Chris, uh, Sarah C. came to me two weeks ago and goes, I've got this great idea for the next show, and, and I know the perfect person to have on. And, of course, I said, well, if Sarah C. loves her, then she's got to be on. So, um, Nisha, without further ado, would you please introduce yourself and let us know all about you? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Nisha Dahlgren, and um, I am a, let's see, I'll, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. I am a landscape architect by trade. I went to school for sociology and then back to school for landscape architecture. And I have been practicing that for the last 20 years. And uh, about five years ago, I became uh, interested, very, uh, I guess six years ago, I became very interested in the food movement after I had my daughter and uh, was petrified that I would pass on my lovely Crohn's disease genes to her and uh, basically went on a uh, quest and earned a PhD in learning about how to feed a brand new baby and not screw it up. And um, basically in that I, I looked at lowering my work hours. Um, I worked for a major corporation um, a little mouse with big ears that everyone knows about and um, I decided to open an organic culinary nursery and my husband was like um, I don't think you're gonna be able to earn any money doing this and I said well let me just try and so I kept my job during the day and I would just run this little thing on the weekend and before you knew it um, I had like this kind of cult underground following coming to our house every weekend buying these organic vegetable starts and I started building kitchen gardens so this was almost the time the recession was kind of at its peak and everybody wanted to start growing their own food but what I really noticed was everybody who came to the nursery was suffering from some sort of health ailment and they were growing their own food because they they were learning more and more about food and um, that sparked me to go uh, back to school and, and start earning a holistic nutrition degree. I, I originally investigating, uh, investigated going back and being a registered dietitian, and I just uh, I wasn't aligned with how um, most of the registered dietitian schools were, were actually presenting food. Um, I think that a lot of, a lot of food programs, people who are interested in nutrition they get trapped in the belief that food is sort of the only answer and I knew from having Crohn's disease and having sort of the whole spectrum that food was only sort of one part of the program and that's that's how I became a third year holistic nutrition student and also I just finished a certification in the psychology of eating so I'm, that's how, Sarah and I, gosh, I don't even know how we met. Did we, I think we met sort of through your foundation. Yeah, you came to our comedy club event. Yeah, yeah, so. And um, then I, I wanted her to work on me. <laughs> she became my, she was my patient for my, like, my, one of my semesters. Yeah, I, that's great. like, take me on. And yeah, it was me fun. On. And now she's stuck with me. Yeah. <laughs> That's all. Awesome. So, um, so yeah, that's that's a little bit about me. And so mainly right now, I'm you know I'm seeing clients. I am certified to see clients, and we, um, I, I'm 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 thinking that I'm going to focus just on Crohn's disease. It's been a really interesting um, opportunity to uh, have people come here who are actually very sick and. Um, really sort of re-tap into that world. I have I have sort of, you know, my Crohn's has evolved over the years. It was pretty horrific. You can 
um, go to my website and read all about it. And um, I had I had I had told Christina today one of the worst cases Stanford Medical Center had ever seen. I had seven fistulas popping out all over my body. I wore a little. Uh, I have an ostomy. I don't have a colon. I have very little short bowel left. Um, so I validate. I, I have Crohn's disease. It just over the last 10 years, it's sort of evolved that my Crohn's symptoms are very quiet. Um, that doesn't mean uh, Sarah and I have talked about this. I have, I still have little mechanical issues. I have a narrowing at one part of my uh, terminal ileum that gets clogged every uh, year or so. And but other than that, I don't. You know, I don't. I feel in good health, which is really fortunate. I feel very, very fortunate for that. That's awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Fire um, away. Let's do some great. questions. Yeah. Um, Nothing too Sarah tricky. <laughs> <laughs> right. Start with um, an easy one. <laughs> Sarah, see, I know that you um you gave me um. Normally, I come up with the questions myself every single month, but um, Sarah C., um, knowing a little bit more about some of the Eastern ways and, and some other things, provided some of the first couple of questions. Did you want me to ask them, or do you want to um, do it, Sarah? I mean, I can ask them. I'm sorry, though, because I can tell I'm delayed, so I'm not sure if what I'm saying is not matching what my... I can hear you perfect. Yeah. So is my body just moving real slow? I think that uh, happens to all of us. You're matching for me. There to me. You're okay, matching good. for me. Um, so Nish, I had a couple questions. Yeah. Because I talk to Nish a lot about diets. I'll call her and I'm like, I'm doing paleo. And she's like, well, let's talk about that for a second. Why are you doing paleo? You don't even eat meat. And I'm like, oh, right. And so like, <laughs> just, I realize that doesn't work for me. Um, so I wanted to ask you, Nish, what have you seen are the top three diets that people tend to go towards and that have, you've actually seen have helped? Obviously, this is a general statement, and obviously not every diet will work for everyone, but when I first was introduced to Crohn's, I didn't even know the concept of changing your diet would even help. So I think this gives a good right. guideline for people to know, like, hey, there's actually certain diets that do seem to help people, not cure, but help, whatever. And... Um, I'm finding my my diet with you because I know I talk to you almost daily, and Nisha works with me to find the diet that works with me. But um, what have you noticed to be the top three things that tend to help overall the majority of the people you deal with? So um, that's a really good question. Um, the the school that I am going to and what I've been trained to do is that, and this is not brushing that question off, is that. Each and every individual has their own bio-individuality. And um, for example, I actually went on the paleo diet just to try it. And within about nine hours of eating the paleo diet, I went into complete ketosis, which is when your body kind of looks for all the glycogen and your fat cells It's from not eating any carbohydrates. I have, as I said, A very little small melon. So withholding carbohydrates for me was almost a death sentence. Like, you know, I was out on the deck. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm really dizzy, and I don't feel good. Oops. Can you see me now? Everybody was yeah, frozen yeah, just for keep a sec. It, just, um, the vi yeah, the so video sometimes for me, will, will lag okay. up, but just keep going with audio. Okay. So for me, personally, the paleo diet didn't work. I also, like I said, I have sort of a little bit of a narrowing, and, you know, raw veggie things get trapped so um, but the things that I've seen people trying of course um, the number one being the GAPS diet and let's just talk about that for a second because um, the interesting thing I saw on um, I think on Marissa and Sarah are had a, a little chat yesterday was it yesterday yeah yesterday yeah. And I yes. was trying to keep an eye on it, and my daughter spilled a glass of water on, uh, like, behind our TV, and I thought we were all going to be electrocuted. So I basically was, like, mopping up water as I was reading. But um, the thing that struck me that was so interesting is, um, and I think, Sarah, you said this, that, yeah, the GAPS diet is great, but it's like, who has time to cook 
like that when you're really sick. And that's sort of the downfall of that diet. It's expensive and it is also really time consuming. And the thing uh, that I also find with GAPS is that when you are on such a rigid diet, could you tell us? We, we, we live on planet Earth. Can you explain? What is GAPS? Yeah. What is the GAPS diet? See, I don't know what the GAPS diet is. I hear oh. people saying it all the time, but you oh, don't okay. know. Oh, okay. So, us. yeah. The GAPS diet is the gut and psychology syndrome diet. And so this, um, this scientist, doctor, did all this research and study, and it's basically, it's, it's, it's basically starting back at square one, and you go on a very uh, limited diet, um, for the first few weeks where it's bone broth and sipping juices and waters. I'm sorry, I'm plugging into a piece of equipment here. Um, so the GAPS diet is basically you kind of you kind of eliminate all food and then you slowly start reintroducing it and it's a lower carbohydrate diet and it's it's basically um, she talks a lot about the integrity of the gut and sort of healing the gut lining. It is a very long and rigorous process, um, and it is, I feel like it almost sets one up for failure. Like, you would have to have almost somebody cooking this diet for you in order, if you were really ill. If you were in bed ill, you could not keep up with the rigor of this diet. And I think I saw that within the chat yesterday, and it, and it really struck me as, the truth because a lot of people are starting to really grasp onto the, the GAPS diet and it's great but I think it's it's also really easy to fail on it and then people start feeling like they've done something wrong or I'm not well because I couldn't keep on this diet forever and um, so that's that's why I'm glad that I introduced the psychology portion of my degree also because there is a lot of psychology in trying to sort of start getting wellness with food. Um, just for Does that make to sense? interject for a second, yes. Um, just to interject for a second, because some of the um, uh, viewers were asking, "What is the GAPS diet?" As you were um, explaining it, I've also put on the event page a link to the Wikipedia article on um, the GAPS diet, so that way they can also um, have something to reference later on. Because Wikipedia is the best source of all time. Yeah, there's a there's a book <laughs> written called The Gut and Psychology Syndrome, and it's it's a very it's it's a great book. Um, you can research it before you get into it. I I have a co-op near me that supports um, GAPS diet, and I brought Sarah to visit it, and they actually cook all of the food for the GAPS diet you would probably spend around three thousand dollars a month maybe to eat this way um, it's you know it's homemade bone broths it's you know gluten-free breads it's you know everything that you would need to eat and a lot of people could not afford that that's an immense amount of money I shouldn't say three thousand but let me it might be a lot it's a lot of money sounds like it so so the so the, so the um, the number one diet so I see to go back and answer the question would be GAPS would be number one, um, gluten free, dairy free, um, and then paleo people are starting to sort of plug into and again um, uh, without seeing somebody it, it would be really hard to say like Sarah said she called me and said I think I'm gonna go on a paleo diet and I said okay um, but you don't eat meat and she was like oh yeah, I'm like, so what, tell me what you would eat on a paleo diet. And she was like, yeah, you're right. So it's just She'd kind eat of her like mom's I, I granola. Think people. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm and that's sorry. a perfect example. Sarah's, Sarah's eating granola and thriving on it. And if I ate that, I would be down at the hospital tonight with the bowel obstruction. Me too. Uh, so, I haven't tested it yet. This is me testing granola. We'll see what happens in a couple of hours. Chew it well. You know my theory. <laughs> I, I was going to say, by the end of the show, if we're not calling an ambulance for Sarah C, then right? I think we've had we. Why do we I think success. I'm driving to West LA tonight? <laughs> my husband just said, why are you eating that? <laughs> <laughs> So all right, so so far, just to recap, we we've got gaps, we got paleo, and what was the what was the other? Well, people experimenting with gluten free, dairy free, um, and sugar free. 
sugar-free, I'd say people are starting to, um, you know, sh there's a really great uh, a video out of UCSF from Dr. Robert Lustig called Sugar, the Bitter Truth, and it talks about it's it's sort of super sciency, but it's also, he's pretty funny, so it's in layman terms, and it talks about how sugar affects inflammation in the bowel um, and the bowel lining, so yeah. But again, I think, um, just to clarify, I think nutrition is just really one little tiny piece of the pie in Crohn's disease. I mean, because I have it, and I know that food is one of the pieces of the equation that I think can um, start helping you feel better. But it is definitely not the only thing. It's not the solution. Would the rest of you guys, Sarah, um, Sarah R., uh, Marissa, and Christina agree with that, that it is a piece of the puzzle, but not necessarily the whole puzzle? Yeah. Um, one thing I just want people to realize is that every single person sitting on this panel probably has a different opinion on something like this. Um, for me, I was going into the hospital. I, I was hospitalized before I had ever even eaten real food because I was 10 months old. Um, right. You know, I do think, I think nutrition is so important for every American out there, you know. Um, Only the American. The world as a whole just really eats <laughs> shitty, but the whole entire world does not have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. So I think That's there's right. a, a lot more that plays into it than diet alone. I don't think that we got this disease because of diet because like I said I wasn't even eating um, I think there's a lot of components to it so I just want everybody to watch or who is watching to understand that there's so many different opinions here on this panel and then in our community um, community wide so I do think though nutrition is super important and I, I grew up so healthy and I feel like our community tends to lean on the healthier side um, than regular Americans anyway so and like I said not everybody in this world has IBD so yeah I just think it's just one little piece of this whole puzzle and if it does make you feel better then that's awesome do it but um, I think there's more that goes into it than just that in my own opinion and as as I can obviously state my son was two months old when he first um, developed symptoms um, he, right. he, there's no way that this is because, you know, I was shoving, you know, um, I don't know, burgers and fries down his throat at, you know, at, at that age. So, um, you know, to say that IBD is caused by some, you know, factor of food um, is, I, I can't subscribe to that. But well, Yeah, well, um, I think it's one of my biggest pet peeves, and probably everybody is, is when you say, I have Crohn's disease or I have ulcerative colitis, people are like, oh, well, what are you eating? Like, are you kidding me? Like, I eat super, super healthy. By the way, I'm eating tonight because I haven't been home all day, and so now I'm eating <laughs> yogurt. I feel like yeah. we're on the it biggest... It only seems appropriate that we're talking about diet and food and that someone should be eating on the panel. Yeah. And it's funny, I think most of the people that I talk to who have IBD, they were, before they were diagnosed or even, you know, after they were diagnosed, they were athletes. So they were, you yeah. know, they were eating really healthy before. I mean, I was a competitive swimmer before I was diagnosed in a couple of years afterwards. And I was swimming before school, you know, after school. And I was, you know, kind of a health nut. So, I mean, I was eating really well. And I just, you know, I agree with everything, um, you know, Sarah R. said. I think that diet is a small piece of it. I think it serves all of us well, not just people with IBD, to eat a, as balanced as you can, but it really is extremely individual. I mean, I can't eat a fully balanced diet at all because I don't have a colon and I have an ostomy, so you kind of have to mm -hmm. sort of test the waters out and see what works for you and know that you didn't get this disease because it was something you ate or something you did wrong. And I think it's just really important for everyone to understand that and know that it is really, I mean, it's you should be working with your doctor um, to decide, you know, what medication treatment, what diet, if necessary. I mean, and all those, they all need to be combined to work together. Uh, I, sorry about that. No, okay. Well, I was just going to say, I think the purpose of this panel and the, what I like about us is every week we touch about something small. So what I love about having Nisha on here is that she had the worst case I've ever heard of Crohn's. And she 
she, whenever I talk to her every day, the, the blessing about it is there, she talks about all the different components that it takes to find a peace in your body. And um, it definitely, I don't think any of us believe that diet causes Crohn's or colitis. It doesn't. I mean, everyone on this panel just stated that very clearly. But it is a component that aggravates. So if we can find education, because I've noticed a lot of people in my support groups don't even think that diet could even possibly help to the point where they still eat whatever the hell they want. I'm talking like pizza, burgers, tacos, whatever the hell they want. Because their doctors say, no, diet doesn't help at all. And I think that's bullshit. I think diet helps everybody. People who have diabetes, people who have obesity, you know what I mean? Like every population of a disease, it helps. It doesn't fix it. It doesn't, sometimes even you can be so healthy and still get sick, it doesn't matter. But it helps you stay a little less sick than maybe you would have if you're eating a bunch of crap. So, um, mm. I, that's why I kind of am happy about having Nisha on this panel because it helps us educate and learn about what diets there are out there how to help guide us, which is my next question for her, which is how can she help guide us in, or what are the tips she can give us to help us find our individual diet that helps, or let me rephrase, what tips can she give us to help us on our own journey on finding what can help us in terms of food? And could that, I, that, could I interject too? Just oh, call it interject and then I want to interject. Okay. <laughs> no, I get to interject. No, I haven't had my chance to interject That's on right. this one. What I love about this panel is I feel like even though diet does not give you Crohn's or cannot necessarily put you in remission, you know, there are tricky things and GIs don't help you with that. I went to see a nutritionist because I really wanted to know how to deal as, um, you know, as someone who loves fresh veggies, how do I do this with a stricture? How do I get through this? And the nutri nutritionist that I went to, or the dietitian, I guess, I'm sorry, she, you know, she advised an all hugely fiber diet. But, uh, you know, if, if they had included information like Nisha, where somewhere I could go to to talk to, you know, to find something that helped soothe my symptoms or helped me get the nutrition that I needed without you know, how I could do this between surgeries, I think there is a real lack in that. And maybe that's just in my state, which is, you know, I live in Hampton no. Roads near Virginia Beach. I was never um, given that option, and I think the one thing I like about this panel is now we get to pick Nisha's brain, and we get to see exactly what she would set out and how she could help someone. And, you know, when Sarah's asking the questions, I would love you know, just if we got a chance to touch on strictures, eating with strictures, and how to do that in a healthy fashion. Oh, trust me, that's that's coming up in, in, in the questions. Okay, because um, for yes. me, when someone said that, um, you know, like Sarah, you said you're really healthy, I I feel like I, I am not at my healthiest point because I am kind of lost on what to eat, and I do tend to eat a lot of pasta and bread, and I know I'm not going on the right path, especially since I have very high triglycerides. I have hyper triglycidemia, and it's and it's you know it affects me very much. I I get um, fat deposits under my skin. This is all genetic. It's nothing once again that I've done to myself. Sometimes, you know, you don't have to be a meat eater to get a huge um, cholesterol problem. So, anyways, I just wanted to say. So, I'm I'm just very interested, and I wish that had been something that my doctor gave me the option of. Instead, he kind of laughed at me, and um, I went you know, about. Unfortunately, it. Western Western medical doctors, and just for the record, I am a big believer in both East and West. I've uh, I sought Remicade. I you know, if I broke my arm, I wouldn't go to my naturopath. I would go to the emergency room and get my arm set. Um, however, in just my personal opinion, Western medicine has sort of fallen short in terms of what it can do in full compassing to help somebody with inflammatory bowel disease. And that's why Sarah C's foundation is so interesting because she sort of combines East meets West. And I think when you have an autoimmune disease, it, it be, behooves you to investigate everything because 
again, what works for me isn't going to work for you and isn't going to work for you. This is a really tricky, slippery little disease. And Frank and I talked the other night, and I said, I think it might start out as one thing. Look at Sarah R., diagnosed as a baby. Frank's child, diagnosed as a baby. It's not like they were manifesting anger at that point or like in a dysfunctional relationship that, you know, no, met, yeah, like where people have all these. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah R. popped what? out angry, man. It wasn't the doctor that slapped her on the rear, man. She slapped the doctor. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm maybe sorry. Sarah I, I, had, case. I no, had to no, just no. interject that. Um, but I have a question, and I say this with all due respect because yes. I am I am so on board. I've always been kind of more of an Eastern um, medicine person growing up, but of course, obviously, I follow Western medicine as well. But I wonder, how do you know? Or it seems like you think that maybe the diet has helped you, but how do you know you're just not in a lucky phase of remission since we know that we go into remission and flare-ups flare and sometimes we just get this long phase of remission? How do you know it was the food that put you there or you're just in a stroke well, of luck? But I, I didn't, food, food was one of the components that put me there. I'm, okay. I'm actually documenting, because as I told Frank, um, so I had my original ileostomy at 18, uh, I got sicker, 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 sicker. At 26, I had my colon out. It was dysplasic. It was precancerous. Uh, by 27, I had seven fistulas. They lasted for a total of three years. So I had five anal, two. I had one vaginal, and I had one popping out right next to my regular ostomy in which I wore a tiny little infant ostomy bag on. I was sick. I was really sick. Oh, I'm and not saying so, you weren't. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I'm just saying diet was only one component that I did. There was all these things in between being 32, 31 years old, and now I'm 45, 46, um, that happened that I feel gave me this, this kind of state of wellness. Um, but the way a lot of people hear the word sort of cure or whatever, that's how I hear remission because it's like, that's like saying I'm sitting around waiting for the other shoe to drop, and I'm not. I, I use, like to use the word wellness because I am well today, and I wake up and I'm well. If I woke up tomorrow and I wasn't well, then that would be the, that I would start that discussion then. But today I'm well. I, I don't like to, I just for me personally, using the word, I guess we can call it a long-term remission if we want, but it's been almost 12 years. So that's a pretty good run, I'd say. But then somebody might hear I'd have, you know, I have a bowel obstruction twice a year, and they're like, oh, well, that's Crohn's disease. Okay. I, I, but in between bowel obstructions, I feel pretty good. How's that? Oh, no, that's, that's great. I was just wondering if you, and I think you answered the question, you think it was a lot more than... Oh, it was a lot. You put, but, Huge. Okay. I, I quit my 70-hour-a-week job. I, um, I met the love of my life who's really supportive. I had a baby. I bought and designed an amazing home. So there was all these components in there that happened that who's to say which one of them or all of them together. Diet was one little piece of the pie. I, were, I ate horrifically. Also, I ate I, McDonald's, Taco Bell. I, I'm sorry. To, I, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you. You were saying um, to me the other night when we were, um, uh, you know, talking that you were also on Remicade for a while. So it 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 was. I was on Remicade, or, right? And so. Yeah. Yep. I think Remicade. I'm a huge believer. Remicade. I think I was on Remicade from the age of 29 to. 31, I really do think that sort of jump-started healing the fistulas. Um, my first Remicade infusion, I crawled into that place, and I came out jogging and scared the shit, excuse me, out of my ex-husband. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I li it was almost like it was that instantaneous on me. Uh, we notice a very, with Remicade, we notice a very, very um, uh, quick turnaround time like for my son as well. Like it was so, it was so ridiculous. That's it's, how it yeah, was for me too. Done. I was at swim practice the next day after my Remicade. Right, like, like yeah. I literally I crawled in, like had yeah. to be wheeled in. Mm -hmm. And 
came out jogging, and he's like, you are scaring me, like, really bad. It's pretty inc incredible. <laughs> so, yeah, again, I think there was just this huge component of things that were right for me to feel good. I was I was really pissed off all the time. Who wouldn't be? I had, like, seven fistulas. That's enough to make anyone pissed off. Yeah. Before we go on to the next question, I just want to um, say two things. Uh, one, Sarah C. was the first to curse, and uh, Nisha was the second. Holly and the rest of our veteran viewers are playing the drinking game, and half of them are probably drunk because of it. Um, <laughs> I haven't even sworn yet. I know. That's what I'm saying. You're slacking. Go ahead. Um, go, go, go. And, for emphasis. Yes, yes. And, it's my um, Irish... It's my Irish upbringing. I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, Ryan was um, impressed to... Ryan Stevens, who's watching, also was impressed to know that uh, you were a competitive swimmer, Marissa. So, uh, our, our oh, my God. I was a swimmer, it. too. Maybe that causes really? Crohn's disease. Marissa actually <laughs> did <laughs> cross like <laughs> That would be new. <laughs> <laughs> that chlorine causes Crohn's disease. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> yeah. That's a new one. I got... Um, chlorinated too much. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, next, uh, next one, Sarah C. So, the next question is, what tips would you give to someone who's trying to find the right diet for themselves? Um, let's see. You know, I would, I would, and not just because this is what I do for a living, I would say I would encourage you to touch base. There is a plethora of people on the internet uh, and in your town. I would search for a nutritionist. Um, again, I'm not a huge um, fan of registered dietitians, but that's just because they follow a different standard of eating than I do. That's not to say you wouldn't find useful information, um, and, I, and I think that everybody is different. I think that what one person might find um, sort of a balance on physically after they eat might work for them and not for others. Um, but I would say try, I, I would encourage someone to work with a professional. I don't think it should be a year-long process. I'm, I'm not a huge believer in that. I'm a bigger believer in sort of getting somebody to where they are feeling better and then they call me if that stops working. But I also don't think any one diet works forever for anybody. I think that we are sort of moving targets, moving around all the time. Excellent. Um, um, and Sarah, I think you have one more. I do. And then to add on that too, Nish, I, you've encouraged me to do this, is a food journal is very helpful to see what you eat and how you react and keep an active food journal and try to find a pattern too sometimes if there yeah. are trigger foods. And it seems really sort of basic. Like you would be like, duh, I ate this and now I don't feel good. But sometimes you're eating and you don't even realize that the food that you've eaten could be causing maybe discomfort 10 hours later. And so if it's written down, you can kind of go back and go, oh, this has happened three times with this food. This might be something I want to take a look at, either eliminating or not eating as much. Beautiful. Great. Next question. Um, this one to Christina. I think this is what you're interested in. What are good foods to help and aid you in getting through an obstruction, a partial blockage, or a stricture? So I'm, I'm assuming, though, partial blockage and obstruction are a little different than stricture. Stricture is more of a consistent issue to deal with, whereas a partial blockage and obstruction is more of a temporary thing. Yeah, so I definitely. Separately. Um, so, for, first of all, I, I take any sort of blockage, partial or otherwise, really seriously. That's nothing to fool around with. Um, I, I mean, I myself have my GI doctors, all his phone numbers on speed dial, and when I do get a blockage, he is my first call. Um, and we just sort of talk through what is what am I feeling exactly, um, and and I do I think a lot of people with Crohn's push the envelope. I usually wait until my heart's super racy, I have vomited up bile, then I go down and get an IV, which is not the smartest thing to do. Um, so in terms of what to eat or not to eat on a partial or a full 
on a full blockage, you wouldn't eat anything, clearly. Sure. Um, yeah. But on a partial blockage, um, you know, there's there's lots of different theories. But again, I would say that's something that you would work with your doctor on because if you're, for example, my blockage blockages happen because I have a narrowing in my bowel where there's t tons of scar adhesion, and the only way to sort of fix this is if, if it narrows down every few years, he goes in and he dilates it. But he knows exactly where that stricture is, and he knows exactly how long it is. And I, I can tell. I know exactly where the food's caught um, and, and how to sort of navigate when I go in. But in terms of, in terms of so a person who has a stricture, um, you know, and, and you want to eat your vegetables, I would encourage someone to, to juice. You know, juicing is a really nice way. I can't even eat juice out of a Vitamix. That's too fibery for me. Um, I, I have a Breville, and it makes the juice clear, so you just basically get the nutrients out of the juice but not the fiber. So I'm sort of shocked that an RD would put you on a high-fiber diet, Christina, but yeah, not. I... This person, I don't understand what was going on. She printed out a lot of stuff, and then she ended up reading from the printout. So I, I wonder <laughs> if I if I wasn't at a scam place. Do you know what I mean? It uh, it was the first time, you yeah. know. It, so I I don't think I I found. You know, she did say, "Well, come back and tell me how this works." And I never, never went back. You know, I realized that I had paid money for something that wasn't good, and it was dangerous. And if I knew more about blockages and how my stricture, you know, acts, then then that's the wrong thing to do. But I've been kind of gun shy because I don't have any recommendations for my area, and I've tried different things that haven't worked and you know we all know how much money it costs just to pay our regular medical bills so I think I've just been kind of conscious of finding someone that comes I have a lot of on my website I have a lot of good res on my website I have a resource for a few books um, one of them is uh, Sally Fallon's cookbook it's a nourishing traditions but I'll try to find some resources to put up there for you. It's it's a newer website, so I don't have, I only have books right now that lead, the books that I would recommend. Um, but yeah, things like strictures and bowel obstructions, those are, those are really tricky, and I would normally work with someone's doctor on that to say, you know, and run it by them, because what, what might work, you know, I don't know how structured you are. Or how long See, that's, it is. That's the thing. Is so it's, I think it's really different for everybody. Right, I know. And and the whole thing is, is uh, you know, he wants to to operate. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not there. You know, I've had three small bowel resections yeah. in, the, in the last four years, and I'm not ready for number four. I was hoping to get a lot longer time in between, but I do have a Vitamix, which I think is really helpful, kind of emulsifying food, and I've been looking for yeah. like really good, yeah. healthy Vitamix recipes as well, so, but I do notice that even when I like emulsify or really have a juice, like there's some things that still irritate me even when they're complete juice, and is that something that's normal to people? With Crohn's, like you well, can't that, eat a blueberry like said, even with if the it's Vitamix, a juice. You're still... Well, that's the interesting thing about the Vitamix. It still holds all the fiber in, so it, it emulsifies it, but it keeps the bulk in. Whereas I bought, and I'm not, I, I'm not a representative of Breville, but I bought a Breville because it actually it extracts the pulp out of the juice, so it's clear, um, and it's. I mean, it looks just like that. It's like clear you can see through it okay and that I was still seems hoping to, to get for some, me or even was, a vitamin I was trying to get like some fiber due to my um, horrible triglycerides um, and try to get that down but I know that I usually only block if I get a piece of food or like a mm -hmm. long string yeah Christina, I, can you maybe find yeah. like um, the, you said that some of the juices you do through Vitamix don't bother you, so maybe do the ones that don't bother you to make those with your Vitamix. 
to get the fiber, and then the okay. other ones I do bother you juice those. Cause I I can literally grab my juicer. I have the same one actually. Nisha has coincidentally, and I love it too. I love that too, and I make a juice and I put kale and celery and carrots, everything that would kill someone like us, and it's good because it takes all the fiber out. And then okay. the stuff that you can handle through the Vitamix, take it that way so you have your balance of fiber. So I, I do smoothies in the morning, and I can handle the fiber of strawberries and blueberries yeah. and banana. And then I juice my greens because I can't handle it. So okay. you can find your right. niche like that, but I can show you what it looks like. And if anybody wants to see what it looks like, Frank, if they're asking, I can pull it and show them what the juicer looks like. Yeah, okay, it's really helpful. If, if, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to interject a question real fast, but if you find it on um, the internet and put the link in the chat, I'll put it on the event page. Yeah, so and I can grab it just to see what it looks like, too. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to throw a question real fast from the, um, from the chat room uh, or from the, um, from the event page, um, and I'm going to butcher the name, and I apologize. Uh, Sammy, it looks like it's Sammy, S-A-M-M-S-A-M-I-I. Um, ask, how how do you re respond to people if they judge you on what foods that you're eating or blaming your flair on your diet when they don't know what necessarily works for you? Um, in other words, uh, as an example, at work last month I had Chinese food and my coworker said, obviously if you're eating Chinese, um, you're going to flare. Um, coworker probably obviously doesn't have IBD um, and, you know, this person does, and yet the non ibd -er is trying to tell the experts, the ibd -ers what to, uh, you know, what's going to make them flare and what isn't. Um, how do you, uh, Nisha, I'm going to let you start real fast, but I'm throwing this to everybody. I'm, you, I totally, I kind of missed the question. He's, he has anxiety over what people are thinking of what he's eating? No. So, I missed the question. Um, what do you do when, when somebody judges you? And, how do you how do you handle it when say someone who doesn't have IBD judges you for the types of food that you're eating? So you you're eating Chinese food and someone comes up to you and says, well, obviously you're going to flare your your you're eating Chinese food like they know better what is uh, good for you. Oh, um, wow. Well, I would I would say you could you. You know that's kind of that's kind of a standing in in kind of your own self and your own body and being comfortable with what you know works for you, mm -hmm. and um, I mean, is he looking for a response to tell this person? I would just say it's really about sort of kind of reconnecting with your own body and and being in that comfortable spot that you have chosen to eat that food today. Um, I like to encourage people not to assign. Uh, good and bad onto a food that um, when you do assign an emotion onto a food it's it can be it can be very sort of shaming in your brain even subconsciously and like if you're eating a piece of chocolate cake and the whole time you're eating it you go oh my god I know I shouldn't be eating this cake you're basically you're you're setting up your um, you know your your nervous system to start you know, not digesting the food correctly. There's a whole thing that starts happening within your body chemically, and that's not like myth. That's that's a fact. When we eat food that we gain pleasure in, our body uh, moves into a di different digestive phase. So if somebody's bad tripping you while you're eating, I would maybe pick up my plate and move away from that person, or you could just laugh and say, "Wow, yep." I don't know. I mean, I used to introduce myself and be like, I'm, I'm allergic to dairy in every restaurant, or dairy will kill me. And it just, you know, just sort of being, I mean, being comfortable in your own body and that sense of self that um, you can choose to eat whatever you want. That's your body mm -hmm. and your choice. Right. I don't know if I answered that good. No, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't think there was a. You did, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think that was good. I'm gonna throw it next to Sarah Ringer. Hi, Sammy. Well, first, I just want to say that we all feel your frustration. We've all been there, and we've all received that judgment. And I think a million things go through your head about what you want to say because it's so frustrating. Because really, you're getting that frustration because those people are just—they don't understand. They have no idea what you're going through, and you just. 
it's it's awful for somebody to judge you and you know everybody is different I have the strangest case I'm finding out of IBD ever because I talk to everyone else my disease has never been food respondent meaning that I can food has never triggered my flares it seems I've never found one thing that has made me feel um, like negative foods or positive foods it's just like when I was flaring everything killed me and when I'm fine I can eat almost everything so um, unfortunately those people are just uneducated they don't understand your disease they don't understand what you're going through and so how I deal with that is is just knowing that knowing in my heart that these people they really have no clue and you just have to be confident in who you are and and have a good support system around you really I come home and I vent to the people that you see on this panel talking to me so have somebody that you can just talk to and get those frustrations out talk to us and I know that we understand but sometimes you know you can't really do anything about those people they're just hard-headed and stupid um, you can try to educate them I do that a lot I try to explain my disease and some people you know will learn and some people won't and and unfortunately you can't change their opinion you just gotta move on and be happy and keep being you is that what we're talking about here really it's not so much that um, the, the the food or the diet that the IBD is eating is good or bad it's the ignorance of the person who is judging and uneducated to know whether or not that food or that diet is bad for that IBD -er. I mean that's like telling somebody next to you if you open that jar your arthritis is gonna get bad so don't do it I mean who does that really it's nobody's place to judge you it's not their job I would I would yeah. agree that I would agree with that 100 percent Marissa I'm I, gonna throw it to you I think it is um, I think it's a really difficult thing to deal with and I think most of us have dealt with you know people commenting about what we're eating or what we're not eating and I think it also really depends on who the person is and your relationship with that person um, for me if I'm fairly close to the person who's commenting I will try and get across them that you know my disease is what it is regardless of what I'm eating and again I mean it really does depend on the relationship but I you know like Sarah said you can try and educate them but at the end of the day you really know your body and you know that you know whatever you're putting into your mouth you're doing because it's the right thing for you to eat at that time and it's the right thing for your body to have and I mean it's obviously easier said than done to not care what anybody says about food but I think also the longer you have this disease the easier it becomes because you just kind of no, I don't want to say accept your I guess limitations but you kind of just sort of adjust to the way your I guess your GI track is and the way you have to kind of live your life and you just become more comfortable in your own skin you know like Sarah R was alluding to I mean you become more comfortable with yourself and I mean you can try and educate people but if you're not really close with someone you can just you know simply say whatever I eat is gonna cause me issues or it's not so I'd rather just enjoy what I'm eating now something along those lines is how I usually go about it but it is a tough one yeah uh, Christina and then Sarah say I think you know I agree with what everyone has said I would tell the person you know hey I I've got this I know what hurts me and what doesn't food is not a part of it it's autoimmune disease and if I could go my whole life without eating Chinese food and I would be perfect then I would never eat Chinese food yeah. so uh, thanks for your opinion <laughs> and then throw the food in their face <laughs> exactly and then you can like say shit a bunch of times and, yeah you know give them the finger but drink, yeah Holly, drink <laughs> uh, I, I do think, I think that's it's something that I think that's something that the people need to realize too and this is where the uneducated part to me comes in is that the the pain and the suffering that an IBD patient will go through when they eat something that they know is really bad for them is um, is so much so that um, you know they're they're not purposely trying to hurt themselves and they're not purposely trying to they, they don't want to be in that pain so you know obviously um, I, I don't know it, there's no logic in that to me if if you knew that that food was going to put you into a ton of pain possible strictures and everything else they, they wouldn't be eating it to begin with so oh you know, I digress I, yeah. I disagree 
Yeah, I still eat stuff I know will kill me. I, I, I'll eat a jar of okay. kimchi and know that I'll be in the emergency room. I'll eat the whole damn jar. I'm very I'm cautious. I won't eat like, anything oh, that I know is bad for me, so I'm, I'm with you. I'm bad. <laughs> it depends on the person, I think. You know, some people like me, I'm very cautious. I've had so many blockages and so many issues that I will do everything and anything I can to avoid the ER, so... But then again, you have you know other people who just want to live life and enjoy. And if it comes with pain, if it comes with a possible ER visit or hospitalization, then that's the price they're willing to pay, and that's their own personal choice. And it's just it's such an individual disease; you can't really judge anybody for what they do or any choices they make. True, very true. I'm Sarah, judging you, Marissa. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Except for Sadie, she can judge anyone. <laughs> right. Um, Sarah, I see that you're holding up uh, what I believe is probably the juicer. Do you want to show? Yeah. So, and then also in the response to him, I honestly say to people when they say that to me, I literally say, don't worry about it. Like when they say that, I'm like, don't worry about it. And yeah. they're like, I'm like, don't worry about it. It's not your problem. Don't worry about it. And then another famous saying, I guess my family says I say a lot, is don't judge me. If I'm doing something, they're like, you shouldn't be eating that. I'm like, don't judge me. I am my own person. Like, leave me alone. Those are my two sayings. This is a juicer. I don't know if you guys can see it very well. Oh, I like it. So you put the veggies oops, on the top. You put them in here, and it pushes it down. Shit. Sorry. And then when you push it down here, all the fiber comes out of here into a trash can, and all the juice comes out of here. That's, That's what mine do. does. Don't mm -hmm. ever forget the trash can. I did. The first time I used mine, I'm a vet. I put it where. That's like the biggest mess in the world. I was cleaning tomato off the ceiling for like three months. Yeah. I, I would have paid to have seen that. That would have been worth every single penny to have watched you guys do that. It um, really is funny. That's because all it takes to get your money. I am on board. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a simple man. I'm a simple, simple man. Hey, pal, um, accepted. Yeah. <laughs> so, Nisha, let me ask you. Um... Should pediatric IBD patients be following the same types of diets that um, adult IBD patients are following, or is their bodies completely different in that in that regard? Well, like, I mean, again, like, let's go back to every single patient is different, and every single need is going to be different. But pediatric patients need more of different things because they're still growing. We are, um, I know for me personally, I was diagnosed not as young as Sarah R. or your son, but I was diagnosed at 12, and therefore, you know, I wasn't getting all the nutrients I needed. I mean, I didn't have a period until I was 19. Like, it was crazy. I didn't have enough body fat. I didn't have. I, there was just like not enough sort of nutrients coming into my body. Um, but so, you know, pediatric patients in general do need a different set of requirements because their brains are growing, their bones are growing, their everything's growing, and it's growing at such a rapid rate that the calorie content needs to be higher. So yeah, it's it's a little different than than how you would treat an adult IBD patient. Just from the standpoint of if you miss certain windows for growth, you sort of miss them, and it's um, it's it's really scary. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree. Um, along those same lines, what about men and women? Are there um, are diets and nutrition's the same for them, or are they different as well? Um, well, I mean, diets in general for men and women, women need certain things due to being, you know, female and you're, you might need different micronutrients than a male would. That's why they have different vitamins packaged up for women and different vitamins packaged up for men. But, but in terms of sort of IBD, I, I wouldn't say men and women would differ um, that vastly. Okay. Sounds good. Um, let's see. What um, what can people do um to say take the anxiety and fears away from eating? Um, 
you know, there, there's been foods for some have become this, should I say, evil. There's so much anxiety and stress built up around meals. Um, what can you do to kind of feel better about eating in general or food in general? Um, that's a great question. Um, it, you know, there's there's so much that that I believe. Again, the the small component that does have to do with that Crohn's, IBD, IBS with food is the stress response, sort of just keeping things activated. Um, for example, Sarah, food doesn't bother her, or it might not bother her if she's not flaring, but stress might bother her. But if she was anxious about eating food, that would be a component of stress that, that might activate her Crohn's. Um, and it's the first thing you know I encourage people to do, and, and Sarah and I have talked a lot about this, is is sort of s slowing down. I know a lot of people with Crohn's, just from what I've seen, eat very quickly. Um, they, they don't chew their food well. And that's just, again, that's such a broad blanketed statement. But those are things that you can start doing, is really slowing down during mealtime, putting your fork down, um, taking a few breaths in between bites, uh, not standing to eat. Um, really sort of making the meal a, a nourishing um, environment. So set the table. Don't just eat out of the container if you've gotten um, something to go. Try to start taking steps to make that food um, part, of a, part of a nourishing um, part of your day and not just something to give fuel. But I, I know that you know, it is tricky that when you have Crohn's, um, and I myself am guilty of it. Food sometimes is just fuel. Like I don't gain a whole s lot of pleasure off. I'm not. I'm not a foodie. I don't watch the Food Network, and 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 yet I'm married to a huge foodie. He loves cooking and sort of the massaging of the food. And I'm just like, just hurry up and cook it. Like let's get this over with. <laughs> you know. But I've learned to by living with a foodie, really sort of start watching that you know, that dance that most people have with food, like taking a bite of chocolate and it's that really pleasurable experience. Um, I, would, I would say slowing down would be number one and, and really stop assigning, you know, judgment about the food you eat. And, it, and it's, a, it's a long, hard exercise to do. It, it comes sort of from within and self. I'm going to start from uh, from my uh, right to left. Um, Whoa, and a question to all of you guys. Um, you know, have you have you guys experienced that anxiety towards food in in your time? And did you guys or do you still experience that anxiety towards food? And did you do things to kind of get yourself, you know, all right with that again, Sarah? C? Um, actually a lot. I, I think I've had, I think this is one of my, if I had to pick my top four issues of Crohn's, this would be one of them. Um, I approach meals really anxious. Um, I are used to, I not as much this year, especially since I've been working with Nisha not as much. Because I remember when I would call her and I would say, oh my god. I had a brownie. And she's like, okay. I'm like, but I'm not supposed to have sugar. She's like, okay, well, next time if you do that, instead of freaking out before, enjoy that brownie. Enjoy every bite of it and, like, love it. And, like, I'm trying to learn to not freak myself out if I am eating something that I think will be a trigger food and just trying to enjoy myself and slowing down. And now since I have really consciously try to slow down while I eat and chew more and try to enjoy the flavors of what I'm eating. I've noticed I actually eat less, so I'm not stuffing things into my system. I've noticed, too, that I have less of a reaction with food because I'm wondering so much, is it so much the food I'm eating now that's triggering it or is it the anxiety before I approach the food that starts the anxiety in my body that triggers the attack after? And maybe it's a combination of both. And I developed this since I was 12. I mean, when I was young, I was told, don't eat that, Sarah, it's going to cause this, and don't eat this, Sarah, it's going to look, see what you did because you ate that. So it's instilled at a very young age, like, 
I'm causing things because I'm eating them. And I'm a huge foodie. I'm the one who watches the Food Network, sit at Pinterest all night pinning recipes, and I love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I love awesome. food. So to me, it's like Crohn's is like God's funny sense of humor to give it to me because it sucks. I wish I could be a chef, but that's not going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to do it anyways. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that slowing down for me has helped me a lot and trying to change the talk in my head. If we really are conscious of what we're saying in our head while we're eating, I notice myself getting like nervous like, oh shit, I just ate that I'm not supposed to. I'm sure going to get sick. Oh shoot, I did this and this. Oh, this and this. and then now I'm just trying to calm down and just say, you know, it's okay. Relax, enjoy what you're doing, and be a little more at peace with the fact that like you're trying to figure out what works for you. And that's helped me a lot. So I, I definitely that's one of my biggest struggles. Sounds good, Sarah. That would be me. Um, yeah. So I feel like I can't answer this question without giving you a little background here. And um, that makes me anxious. So um, <laughs> one thing that I have never really addressed on my blog or in my writing because my blog is focused solely on my life with Crohn's disease is I was in treatment for an eating disorder about 10 years ago. And um, I was put in there for anorexia. And of course, my weight recovered fast. But psychologically, it takes a lot longer to develop a healthy relationship with food. You can get your weight back to a healthy weight, but you're going to have demons in your head about how you feel towards food because food is so psychological. It, it, eating is such a psychological thing. So um, through the course of growing up, I was put on so many strange diets from my sicknesses. I don't want to date myself, but um, I was born in 1982, in the beginning of the 80s, so back then not much was understood about Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and um, so I was put on really strange diets. They didn't even know what I was having, and so I was very focused on food from a very young age, and it only spiraled out of control. So uh, I don't know if I can really say, see my voice is all shaky because I never like told people this stuff. Um, but I don't know if I can say that I have even fully like learned how to enjoy food in the proper way. So I can't really answer that question. Eating for me is still like there's always a thought process going on when I'm eating because if it isn't one thing, if it's not, you know, am I going to get sick? I've dealt with, I don't have a colon either, so I've been through many blockages, partial blockages. Is it the food causing it? Um, you know, and then there's just other own personal food battles that I face that may not even be IBD related. So it is just a process learning how to enjoy food and I think a lot of people, even aside from people with disordered eating patterns, and a lot of us do have disordered eating patterns, have to learn how to, like um, you guys were saying, look at food as something that's going to nourish your body and that's good for you and that's not always easy for us to do. Agreed. Marissa? Um. Food has always been an issue for me since I was diagnosed. Before, I loved eating. I ate all the time. Like I said, I was a swimmer, so I needed to eat a tremendous amount. But once I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, that really completely changed. I was originally put on a completely bland diet. My first gastroenterologist really tried to ingrain in my head that I shouldn't be eating anything aside from plain pasta, saltines, baked potato, just really very plain. Me that was too. My, my doctor told me to eat just rice. Yeah, and <laughs> rice, right, rice. I forgot about that. Yep. Um, so that was my first real experience with the fact that I was now going to be living with a disease that was going to impact the foods I ate. And now, you know, 13 years later, I don't have a healthy relationship with food. I um, I don't eat during the day because I don't want to live in the bathroom. So I eat only at night, pretty much after 7 o'clock. Um, it's only been recently that I've been able to eat a little bit more maybe during the day if I'm with people that who know my situation or who I trust. Um, I was never able to really go out to dinner and I completely avoided any social situations that revolved around food, which is an enormous amount of them. 
um, because I really had to micromanage and still do every single thing I put in my body. So food is, I mean, while I enjoy it, it's not an enjoyable thing for me to do. I mean, I have my favorite foods, obviously, but I've really, I've developed foods that, I mean, I won't use good and bad, but I have foods that I consider safe in that they won't land me in the ER with a blockage. Um, there are foods that I know are not that great and that I'll be running to the bathroom all the time, and then there are foods that I know I just won't even go near. So this is um, this is definitely one of the hardest parts of having IBD for me because it's just it's never just like I go to the kitchen and I take something and I eat it. It's always a lot. It's always a thought. It's always what time of day am I doing this? What am I going to be doing afterwards? What am I you know what is going on in my world at that time? Am I going to be home? Am I going to be near a bathroom? So it's um it's it's hard to manage once you've been diagnosed I think your thought process change changes in terms of food and for me I I'm definitely getting better at it I'm getting more comfortable with it because I think I'm a lot more I'm a lot more accepting of my ostomy so in that way I think the whole food issue is a little bit less but it's still a big source of anxiety for me can I ask a question yeah, yeah. Marissa, um, yeah. my sweet one, like, <laughs> how, how do you, how do you deal with energy during the day? Because I bet a lot of people do that too, and I, I just, the thought of not eating all day, like, do you not, have you like trained yourself hungry during the day? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I think I'm just so used to it. Like when I got um my cock pouch is a continent ileostomy, um maybe six years ago or seven years ago, I don't remember. Um, I just really quickly learned that the way to avoid being in the bathroom, like I just, I didn't want to think about IBD. I didn't want to think about that I had something on my stomach. I just, I wanted to pretend it wasn't there pretty much. So my way of doing it was to just not eat during the day. So I think that my body's just so used to that way of eating that now if I'll eat during the day, it's strange to me. And I mean... I'm sure I definitely should be drinking more. I know it's not a healthy way to live or eat, and I know all that. But um, I think I'm just really used to it by now. I think that's that's pretty much what it is. I think my body's just adjusted to not eating until you know seven or eight at night. So is it just like one meal a day? Yeah, I pretty much. I don't. Know, I pretty much. Um, yeah, I mean, I eat. I don't even really eat meals. I eat kind of like graze between like seven and the time I go to sleep. So that's pretty much what I do. And like I said, I'm getting I'm definitely getting better and more comfortable with eating out. And, you know, I have been going out to dinner more and actually eating as opposed to just sitting there while other people eat. But um, it's, def it's taken me a long time. I mean, I had an ostomy for three years as a teenager, and this is my second year with this, um, this new one. And, I mean, it's so, so much trial and error. So it's, I mean, it's, it's a process. But what kind of ostomy do you have? I have an ileostomy, no. Marissa, I'm super proud of you for all the, like, steps you've made. Thank you, Sarah. You start, yeah. It started with you and me watching your video. Thank you. Well, I love your honesty, Marissa, because I know a lot of people probably relate to what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I have a quick question for Nisha. Nisha, do you eat, yes. do you eat a lot of salt? Do I? Yeah. I do. I was just wondering, I, most everyone I meet without a colon, like, yeah. I know me and Marissa, we eat a ton of salt, but I was wondering if you do as well. I think, yeah, and I think that's a normal, the one thing I was, um, I didn't mean to hijack Christina's turn, but um, I think no, when okay. you do, <laughs> when you do lack a colon, and the, the reason I asked you what kind of ostomy you have is I have an ileostomy too, and I... I did something for the first time the other day. I counted how many times I actually empty it during the day. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, I'm in the bathroom all day. And my husband's it's, like, yeah, pretty much. Mm. But it's such, you know, I'm so, I'm like, so, I'm in and out of there in, like, literally 10 seconds. That, yeah. Um, that, it, yeah. I guess it's like this not. And I, and I work at home. I don't work anywhere. You know, I, I worked in a firm for a month where somebody was like, you go to the bathroom a lot. And I'm like, yeah, mind your own business. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> but um, so I would under, I understand. But, yes, Sarah, R, I do eat a lot of salt. But I think that that is, um, you know, if my holistic nutritionist cohort saw that during, you know, when I'm dehydrated, I can drink a whole 
uh, thing of Gatorade, and everybody would be like, oh, the sugar and the salt, and it's like, listen, dude, I don't have a colon, and like, I'm going down, like, I need, you know, my, my equilibrium is way different than other people's, and the sugar and the salt, actually, that keeps me alive that hour, <laughs> so... Yeah. Good. I'm a holistic nutritionist except for my Gatorade. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Christina, you can have But I think that's a time. very natural. What were you going to say? Who? I said I think that uh, eating salt without a colon, your electrolyte balance is different than somebody who has a colon because that's where your your water's pulled out. And so our our balance of how we keep our water together is a lot different. In fact, right. I'm getting I'm getting hungry for something salty right now. Me too, actually. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, all right, so we'll we'll move it along so that way uh, we can all leave to go eat. Um, but Christina uh, has to answer the question. Oh, do we have to? <laughs> all right, go ahead. Yes. Oh, you're so cold, Frank. That's not nice. <laughs> he knows what he's getting for Christmas, and it starts with. But and ends with break. <laughs> you know, I don't think I. What's this? The third or fourth episode now we've had that you know that that has come up at least once. It has to come up once an episode, or it's not the true roundtable. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I have nothing good to offer to this topic. I also I eat one meal a day. Um, I can't eat any more, or I become blocked completely, and. Mm. I do you also eat it at, at night like Marissa or well, is it I, a different time? I try to eat at six because if I eat too late then I'm up all night long getting rid of the food mm -hmm. and it's usually painful process and then I don't sleep and then I have to be able to work and take care of the kids the next day. So it's kind of a balancing act. I can't eat and then have to be on a phone meeting with someone, you know, so, I, I'm just, I'm not at a healthy point. I don't have a good relationship with food. I hate thinking about it. I used to love cooking. Now, thinking about dinner actually makes me angry. I hate everything about food. And it, you know, I think I have negative thoughts about everything I eat. And I also have to deal with um, the triglyceride issue. You know, my um, endocrinologist is like, why aren't you, you know, you got to be eating all this high fiber foods. And my GI's, you know, like, hey, if you eat some more high fiber foods, we might be in trouble here. So it, I feel like I'm like, I, I'm at a can't win type thing. So my husband actually makes dinner for everyone. And we don't even sit down anymore because when we sit down, it just reminds me that I'm probably doing something to myself that's only going to make me sick. So my, my Crohn's is very food related because of narrowings and, and inflammation and so there's there's nothing good about food and when I look forward to food it's very depressing because I know it's going to be good but I have like a one minute you know a lot of times you know if I'm over at someone's house eating a really good meal I'll have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the meal and the whole point is trying to hold on so that people don't look at me and say oh she's gone for 20 minutes you know everyone tries to wait for you so the whole thing around it I'm just not in a good spot so I, I, I don't know that there's a solution for me you know but you do what you got to do, and I um, I drink soda during the day. <laughs> to that's my food, and it's horrible. I know it's horrible, and I'm ashamed admitting it. But if I don't have soda, then I don't have enough energy to do anything else. So yeah. it's hard when you have strictures and blockages because it's like mm -hmm. almost impossible to eat, or it's painful to eat. And I found I had a lot of luck with, like, have you tried a lot of liquid nutritions, or is that blocking you up as well? Well, you know, I do I do drink Ensure mm -hmm. um, sometimes, and I used to drink more of it, but after my third surgery, you know, I, had, I have a lot of problems, um, emotional problems, you know, like you've written about, Sarah, about the PTSD. Yeah. 
Um, I had a hard time eating after, you know, two months in the hospital. And so I drank Ensure. So now every time I taste Ensure, yeah. I feel like I'm back in that spot. Mm -hmm. So I avoid Ensure. I, you know, I know I've got to find some way to be able to, to deal with this. And at one point, hopefully I will. But, yeah, it, food is, is not a pleasant experience for me anymore. I just try to get it down and try to eat something without fiber. I just want to hug everybody for all of them. I know, group hug. A great big hug fest. I... Except for Frankie, he just gets butt raped. <laughs> <laughs> this is wrong. <laughs> um... So, oh, I gotta say this. Shit, so somebody could drink. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad that, you know, we can make our um, our viewers, you know, completely um, hung over the next day for work. <laughs> and when their bosses and colleagues ask why, I watched the round table last night. <laughs> and they were all so goddamn depressing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually a very happy person. Yeah. <laughs> I'm most happy when I'm making everyone else drink. Um, <laughs> no, I am. I'm a very happy person. So, Nisha, do you think, I'm going to throw this to you first, but excess of everyone also, do you think that doctors put as much of a, and when I say doctors, I'm talking about GIMDs, do you think that they hold as much value to diet and nutrition being a um, being part of the treatment process? as, say, yourself and others do? Or do you think that on, not speaking for every GI, not speaking for every MD, but that they um, somehow, you know, overlook or don't hold much value to it? And she's gone. So I'll pay it to Sarah <laughs> That's first. how she thinks about you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, she I loved that question so much. <laughs> she's out. <laughs> Do you, seriously, do you do you think that GIs and MDs, um, you know, hold as much value to diet and nutrition as say everyone else? Uh, so glad you repeated the question because I was busy reading the roundtable for what people were saying. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, do I think doctors hold the same value as? Do Do you think they hold as much of an importance as making diet and nutrition part of the treatment process? One of the treatment processes, or do you think that they ignore that and kind of um, overlook it? Uh, I I can speak from my personal experience, from my experience with GIs, and I do not think my GIs put any value to food. The first time my GI ever gave me an opinion on food was when I was in the hospital bed and I was leaving to go home and he said, don't eat fruits or vegetables and don't have dairy, good luck. And I was like, okay. Whereas before, the only opinion he ever gave me was don't eat fresh fruits or vegetables. That's, that's the only opinion I ever got, ever, since I was 12 and now I'm 29. So. That is the only thing that they think. And I always had my GI reiterate, like, it doesn't matter what you eat. If you're going to get sick, you're going to get sick, which there's a truth to that. But um, he never finding if I might have, like, what we like to call a trigger food or never encouraged to say anything like that. So from my experience and what I've heard people say is most GI say diet does not matter at all and don't worry about it. Focus on taking your medication and that's it. Mm -hmm. Uh. Sarah Ringer? Um, no, I don't think that GI doctors focus enough on nutrition, not as much as um, the rest of the world, like you were saying. I think that more and more doctors are starting to, so that's a good sign. But um, in my own experience, because again, I can only speak from my own experience, um, as a child, I was told silly things like just eat white rice. Um, which I took to mean as a child that that was the only thing that I could eat. And so I only ate white rice, which was, you know, a very, very restricted and not healthy diet to have. But I thought that that was all I could do. And then um, in my adulthood, I've never had a GI really talk to me about nutrition at all. The only times that I have been spoken to is when I get so underweight 
like severely underweight where they want me to start supplementing with, um, you know, they send you home with those really high calorie Ensure shakes or when I'm on TPN, but clearly that's not a diet. <laughs> um, so no, not really. I don't, I, I've never really had a doctor that focuses too much on that. I do have a rheumatologist, however, who is very, very into Eastern medicine and has spoken with me a lot on nutrition. So not a GI doctor, but my rheumatologist has. What does your rheumatologist tell you? Um, he's given me a certain things for juicing, um, a lot on digestive enzymes and looking into that. Some of the things that he was talking to me about didn't work personally for me just because I, I don't eat meat and I haven't since I was a kid. So, um, and he didn't know that. So he was talking to me about eating things like liver and stuff like that, but that I obviously can't do. But I took a lot from him with the whole juicing thing and how that could help me and digestive enzymes and stuff like that. Great. Uh Nisha, you Nisha, you yes. have um, you have the uh, you're you're kind of on both sides. You're not only um, a long term uh, IBD patient, um, but you're also a nutritionist. Say it one so more time. I said you're not only um, you're you're kind of uh, you've kind of got both sides to this. You're not only a long term uh, Crohn's uh, patient, but you're also um, you know working your way through school um, as a nutritionist and, um, you know, have studied on a psychology meeting. Do you, do you see GIs and, and MDs in general holding as much value in making diet part of the um, treatment process? Or not at all. They, like they not even, not, e not at all. In fact, mm -hmm. my own, I, I mean, I have, I have asked GI doctors flat out, do they think nutrition can either enhance or um, decrease somebody's wellness who has Crohn's? And and most of them, I ask, say no. And I and I to myself, I I think that's so curious that something you're actually swallowing and is going through the portion that is ill, um, that somebody who studies that for a living wouldn't think that that could have any causative effect on. Um, you know what what's traveling through there it just seems so kind of no-brainer to me but I, I think I, I've heard that doctors get one semester of nutrition in college um, and again registered dietitians um, coming from their standpoint study the standard American diet which is the the old pyramid or the plate um, and and again the only reason I didn't go back to become a dietitian is I, I didn't really it didn't resonate with me, um, and you know, a, lo a lot of a lot of registered dietitian programs are supported by the food industry, and it's um, you know, and we'll we won't name names, but packaged foods mm -hmm. make huge donations to nutrition schools, and I just really I'm more of a supportive of whole foods um, eating kind of as they were intended to be eaten. Mm -hmm. Marissa, the you? one thing I wanted to say, and I guess uh, Sarah's not Sarah R's not here, but one thing I have noticed um, after finishing the certification in the psychology of eating is that secondary eating disorders with um, with chronic primary illnesses is is actually very common, and I know a couple um, we've a couple of people have mentioned PTSD, and it's you know, there, it's like there's this whole entwinement of when you have a primary uh, disorder around food, like Crohn's, colitis, anything to do with food, um, you can develop a secondary eating disorder very easily and very quickly. It's 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 you know, it's just it's it's one margin away. If you're if you're afraid to eat, that's you know, you start sort of blending into anorexia quite quickly. Or bulimia. It's like you might be naturally vomiting because you're sick from the food, and then that trigger can sort of move into full bone blown bulimia or anorexia. Uh, Marissa, what about you? Uh, have you noticed in your time that GIs either overlook or um, don't, you know, don't put any 
importance towards nutrition and diet or uh, maybe the opposite? Yeah, I've got to really have a doctor that I found was helpful in terms of diet and nutrition. Um, you know, some of them were great at answering, you know, direct questions. You know, if I eat this, what do you think will happen? And they would give me their best guess. But, you know, when I was in the hospital, I would really just get these, like, generic pamphlets of, you know, I think it was, like, separated into three columns of things that were good for me. And it actually was labeled that, bad and then indifferent. And so for maybe, like, five or six years, I kind of had this mentality of if I would just stick to this pamphlet that was given to me by the nutritionist in the hospital that my doctor worked worked with, and I knew that, um, then I would be okay. And because that obviously wasn't the case, it would be frustrating for me. But I think any good GI or any good doctor will take into account the nutritional needs of their patient. But at the end of the day, it I think we do have to acknowledge that it isn't their job to educate us on that. It's their job to incorporate it into our treatment plan since, you know, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis are, you know, so related to digestion. But um, I've really, like I said, yet to find a doctor that was helpful in this area. My surgeon, who I had a relationship with and a close one for 10 years, was, like, tried everything possible. I think he wanted me to have the mentality of, I can do anything and everything I did before I was diagnosed and he wanted me to eat and that included eating and like Sarah R mentioned you know when I would get underweight that would be even much more of a focus but I mean I really don't think that that at least from what I gather that nutrition is part of their training or at least a good part of their training because I mean I think it's really about western medicine so I think like I said any good doctor will listen to your concerns and if you are somebody who really wants to do things the natural way or at least incorporated it they will hear you out and they will offer their best opinions but um, I, I don't think that they're really trained to look at that as a huge part of the treatment plan that they come up um, for for you. Yeah. Slow talker, I mean, Christina. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Frank. You know I'm going to get you back. I, it may be a while, but it's coming. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, um, uh -huh. I, my doctors have never talked to me about diet. Um, I tried to do it on my own, you know, like I mm -hmm. talked about my failed attempt, but I kind of got scared off of trying again. And, you know, it's something I should try again. But for me, I've kind of developed my own, you know, way of looking at diet and what helps me and what causes inflammation and what doesn't. And even though right now I'm not at the healthiest place with food, um, I do think it could be hard for GIs to really say, okay, here's what you should eat because you know, half or third are going to come back and say, wait a second, I ate this banana and I almost died. And then the next person will come back and said, oh, I'm doing great on this banana. And the next person will say, oh, you know. So I understand that, like, I thought, you know, what Marissa said, where we have to acknowledge that it's, it's not part of their job. But then again, you know, should it be? Should a referral to a nutritionist be something? that they they give us or or mention that we should seek I, um I don't know I've like I said never talked to about it I I went searching on my own and and I'm kinda lost on the subject that's why I think this this roundtable has been so great especially for me I've learned a lot can I I wanted to say too, Christina my do, my GI was actually telling me that in other countries he was speaking I forgot what country it was but their GI offices are so um, whole body intricate that they even have like a sex therapist on the team to work oh, with geez. Crohn's and colitis to work with their partner mm -hmm. because it affects sex. They have a holistic nutritionist. They have an acupuncturist on the team. Like some some places are trying to take a whole approach, and it's just it's really cool. Like even the the, the, the sex therapist thing is the one that got me the most because I'm thinking. No one talks about that and talks about how having Crohn's or colitis can impact your sex life, especially when you're married, especially when having children in general can impact people's sex life, let alone then you add Crohn's on top of it. Like, what happens? And um, I thought that was just a very cool concept. You know, I, I would actually thought it was great. My GI, my I'm not seeing him anymore, 
but not because of this, but he said, how's your sex life? And I swear to God, I was so thrown through a loop that <laughs> I don't embarrass easily, but I, I froze. And I know that I probably had a not so welcoming look on my face. And I totally pretended like he didn't ask me. And then he said, you know, it is a family disease, and I'm sure it affects your husband as well. And I thought, oh, God, I so can't talk about this with you. But, you know, I, I wish I could go back and tell, them, tell him that I really appreciate the fact that he made that effort to talk to me about that. Um, and, in fact, I brought it up to my current GI. I said, yeah, I really like the fact that he brought that up. And he's like, well, how's your sex life? And I said, that doesn't mean I want to talk about it. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it was just kind of funny. But I do think, you know, I saw one place, I think it was in Atlanta, where you could go in and you had actual therapists on staff to talk about emotional issues. And you had um, nutritionists on staff. And, I mean, I really think that that would be an incredible place to be. I don't have those resources where I am, but I, I imagine that those patients benefit from that whole whole body, whole mind, whole spirit approach. Yeah, I know that the UCLA IBT team is actually really working towards that, and they just contacted me too to try to get a hold of a yoga teacher to start adding even yoga into their program. And they have you check in every, I think, month or so. They send a questionnaire about what your life is like, your stress levels, your diet, and everything. And they're really trying to take a whole body approach, which I think is really cool. I think things are changing very slowly. So I yeah. think it's fun to see that. And I, yeah. can I just jump in and say one thing really quick? I feel like I've sort of RD bashed tonight. And I think there's really amazing RDs out there. And there's, you know, I happen to see one when I was a child that gave me wackadoodle information like Sarah R. I was put on a 3,000 calorie raw egg whole milk ice cream diet to gain weight and it like I think it nearly killed me but like anything I think there are good and bad of everything and just because I chose not to become a registered dietitian doesn't mean that there are all, they're all bad. There are good, I know good, in fact I had lunch with one yesterday. There are amazing registered dietitians out there and and it's sort of like anything you, when you're seeking medical advice you can get good and bad information from really anything. Yeah, yeah I, I, would, I would definitely agree with that. Um, and thank you all for saving the sex talk to the end of the program. Um, oh, so now we get to talk about sex? It's it's past ten o'clock, so we're allowed. We, we've now turned into Cinemax. Um, it's <laughs> after dark. Uh, IBD after yeah. dark. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great title for a new show. That Thank you, Nisha. Good. It's going to consist you. of everyone going to the bathroom after having eaten dinner. That is IBD <laughs> after dark. Okay. And that really will be a pant. That really will be a pantless show. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you're um, saying. I always use the bathroom in pants, full clothes. <laughs> uh, and she's not kidding about that, people. I um, mean, sometimes I <laughs> use the bathroom in my pants. <laughs> um. All right, so we're going to wrap it up soon, but just a, a quick question, um, and this is for everybody. Uh, do you guys find that you withdraw from social situations that involve food? It, will you um, not, you know, if you know that the event that someone has invited you to is based around food or, you know, has too much to do with food in it that you will... Um, make an excuse to not go or just, you know, not go, period, you know, because of it. Um, what has your experience has been like with that? Christina, I'll start with you this time. Uh, yes, I'm pretty honest. I don't make an excuse. I just tell them there's no way I can go to that restaurant and make it home in time without having an accident. Um, it, it's sad. I don't go out with my friends as much as I used to, and I miss that. For me... I find it's hard though. I know Marissa had mentioned, you know, sitting and, and watching people eat. For me, it's very hard for me to do that. I start to feel real bitter and upset. I'm not bitter at them, bitter at my my condition 
and then I think, God, you know, I just really want to eat, and then I try to look normal, and I eat, and it's just like timing when to leave the restaurant. I'll take a ton of Lamotol and all these different pills in order to be able to get home in time. The whole thing for me is a very, um, I never know what's going to happen. I could go out to eat and be okay, or I could do that, but I am more comfortable like for holidays at people's homes where there's bathrooms. Even then, you know, I don't particularly want to be the one who uses the bathroom, but you know, it's at least easier and my family knows. Mm -hmm. Christina, or Christina, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> Marissa. You don't even know your own girlfriend's name. <laughs> um, I used to withdraw a lot from any kind of food situation, but, um, and then I realized that I was perfectly comfortable going and just sitting there because it was better for me. I mean, anytime I would go someplace with my friends and actually eat like them, then I wouldn't be able to go out afterwards. I would have to go home. So for me, just being able to go out to dinner and sit there, maybe sip on some water, but even that most of the time was too much for me. So just being able to go out and be present and then know that then I probably had a better chance of having the freedom to go out after or do whatever was, you know, normal, it was a normal thing to do later on that day. It made me realize that um, I was better off being there and not eating than staying home. And I think that once the people in my life kind of understood a little bit more about what I was going through, not at all details, but sort of understood, well, this is just the way Marissa is. And I made a ton of excuses. You know, I mean, I always pretended like I either ate a lot before or I wasn't hungry or, you know, I pretty much made every excuse in the book. But I... Um, I became a lot more comfortable just being places and sitting there and you know watching other people eat because I knew that that was best for me and that it gave me the freedom to I wouldn't I it would be less likely that I'd be in the bathroom and have pain and all that so I think it also depends on the people that you're with I mean if you're in a social situation with people who are going to look at you and wonder, you know, why are you just sitting there at this restaurant? Why don't you just eat something? You know, you're going to feel badly and you're going to feel guilty and you're not going to even want to bother going out because it's just easier not to. So I think it also depends on the place you are in in your illness and it depends on the people you're with. So it, I mean, it really depends. But like I said, I used to withdraw a lot and um, it, it's, it's a hard thing to do because, you know, society is so food-centric. Yeah. Nisha? Um, what's the question again? <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever, or do you find yourself even now, withdrawing from social situations because of that they're, they're, that they're centered around food? Um, what, you know, there's a little more freedom with the ostomy, I guess, but if I know that, uh, like, we went to a pumpkin patch last week, and I knew that the only thing there was going to be, like, like fair food, um, which, although delightful, can also cause a situation quickly, um, meaning I would just have to empty it more there. I, I did eat a little something before I left, just so I had something in my stomach, I, I rely heavily on, on applesauce to sort of slow down my motility, um, kind of thicken everything up so it's not so urgent. Um, and I keep my, you know, I keep an emergency stash of um, uh, Lomatel in my purse. But um, I don't, I wouldn't say I generally avoid places, but I'm, I don't know. I I think I'm a lot older than everyone on these on the panel right now. I just I kind of just go, and everybody pretty much knows. If I mean, I will get up in the middle of a dinner party like four times, I, and I don't really care what anyone thinks. I mean, I know that's that's easier said than done, but I just I sort of I'm at I've had this since I was 12, so I'm sort of at the point where it's like I'm my my clock's ticking, and it's like I'm only on planet Earth for a while, and it's like I don't really care if you think I'm going to the bathroom 20 times. I, I just, yeah. I kind of go. So I, I I don't avoid situations, but I do, that doesn't mean I don't get anxiety in food situations mm. because I will be somewhere where I think the food looks kind of janky and then I'll be like, shit, I know this is going to give me diarrhea. Like, I know it. 
Um, so, not I don't avoid places, but I do still get a bit of anxiety around food. Yeah, Sarah, or yeah, um, I've come a really long way from where I was in the past, and I think for me, recovering from an eating disorder and going into that treatment, and then going through everything that I did with this disease and being so sick, I'm. I've kind of made it a personal goal of mine that I've been practicing in the five year, the past five years or so that when I can that I'm going to enjoy life as, as much as I can and, and really try to live my life positively these days so I don't I try my best to not avoid situations like that anymore if I can prevent it if my disease is in remission or if I'm doing well if I'm feeling well that I make it a goal of mine to go out and enjoy social situations and situations that revolve around food and try to take part in stuff like that because it, it just helps me personally to, to make progress in life um, if I'm doing well. But in the past, before I had my colon removed and when I was so, so sick, I spent most of my time isolating myself. I did a really good job of just keeping myself away from everyone because I was embarrassed of my disease. I was in pain all the time. I knew if I went, you know, I was living on co in, in college on campus and my best friends were like four flights of stairs uh, above me and if I just went up there sometimes I couldn't make it back down to get to my bathroom when I was at my sickest. So I stopped going anywhere. I wouldn't even go to dorm rooms of my friends and it was a, a very lonely life, as we all know. And I, I avoided food situations, of course. Anything social almost revolves around food. So it, it's so lonely. And I was so embarrassed. It was just such an ugly place for me to be in that now that I can sometimes enjoy stuff like that, I, I really make it a goal to do that, to, to just live life to the fullest and enjoy things when I can because you don't get that opportunity all of the time. We've definitely seen that. We've had those horrible days where we know we have to take the good days and run with them. So I really try to. Now and I'm I'm a lot better. I eat around people when I can and I don't I'm not embarrassed of my disease anymore. Obviously I talk about it on the internet to everybody. People can Google my name and and hear me talk about a lot of things. So um, I've come a long way, so and I just encourage people to try at it and, and practice when you can. There are going to be times where you can't. You're going to be so sick that you can't do those things, and, and I understand that I've been there. But when I can do it, um, it's a point to me now just to do those things. That's great. Sarah C? So I'm kind of blessed. I'm blessed with really... Uh, a very loving support network and it took me a while to create the support network. This is not something I've had my whole life but um, between friends and family I've had my whole life but between friends where every time I'm invited out to dinner or we go out I'm allowed to choose where we eat. It's always Sarah picks and we can accommodate it's not a big deal and if I go to people's house they call me and say hey what can you eat today because they know that it's a, it's a daily changing thing um, I would say food does not impact me socially. I would say what impacts me the most, honestly, is the other aspects of Crohn's, which is my fatigue. Like, just that's the biggest one, my exhaustion. I'm always so tired and have such a lack of energy to want to do anything that that impacts me way more and prevents me from going out than my dietary restriction. Well, I think that pretty much wraps it up for us tonight. Um... I want to, I want to thank everyone, Nisha. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, yeah, thank you seriously. for having me. It was really fun. It was very insightful, and I really, really appreciate you you coming on. Hopefully, and I will. Um, I'll try to put some resources up. I, I, all I have right now is books. But the one thing I did want to say is there's a great um, meditation by somebody called Bell Ruth Napersock. It's she talks super slow, and the first time I heard it, I almost went crazy. But I actually listened to her. She has one specifically for IBD. Um, so when I'm going, if I have to go to a job site or go somewhere to a client's house and 
I need just to like get into a mellow spot. Um, so I'll try to put one of her meditations up on my site too. Great, thank you so much. Um, so as we normally do towards the tail end, um, I'm going to ask everybody um, to, you know, go through their spiel again where everyone um, can find each other. But remember again, please do me a favor, go, run over to YouTube, just click that subscribe button. Um, inside uh, the events page, there is um, a link to my YouTube page. Um, also, if you want to be able to get the roundtables every single month uh, from iTunes, automatically downloaded as soon as they're done, just go ahead and click that, uh, that uh, subscribe button as well. Um, again, uh, visit our website, um, ccfect.org, uh, for our blog, along with all the other useful information that's on there. Um, I appreciate right here, 100%, um, all the viewers, everybody who, um, who comes and watches every single month. It means the world to me, and I really can't thank you guys enough for supporting us, for watching us, and for listening to um, some of our bad jokes. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, Christina, why don't you start us off? Let us know where we can find you. Uh, thank you guys for watching and for asking questions. I'm sorry I wasn't able to read them as they went, but I just took a look and I love the people who watch us. It, it just makes it all worthwhile. And uh, you guys offer us as much support as um, hopefully that we're offering you. So once again, um, on the Crohn's and Ulcerative Colitis Diaries on Facebook. And my blog is on livings.org. And on Twitter, um, at Crohn's Diaries. And definitely follow me. I follow back. I love to meet new people and read about new things and all points of view. So thanks for having me and thanks for having me, Frank. Always. It wouldn't be a round table without you. <laughs> Marissa? That is nice. Um, thank you all for watching. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for having me tonight, too. It was really fun to talk about this, these issues and I I just it was a really great time. Um, you can find me. My blog is keeping things inside is bad for my health. Wordpress.com. I'm also on Twitter at Marissa IIF, and I share the Facebook page with Christina, the Crohn's and Ulcerative Colitis Diaries, Living with IBD. I hope you have a great night, everybody, and thank you again for watching. So glad that uh, we had you on. Um, I, you know, we've always obviously talk and uh, I've been wanting to have you on for a while so I'm so glad that you're here with us tonight. Me, me too. Nisha. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. I'm going to throw up now from this love fest. Hey look, I, I could have gotten a lot worse right there. You know, I appreciate that I only went halfway there. I appreciate it. IBD after dark is not starting yet. <laughs> Nisha. Um, okay, thank you so much for having me on. This was a lot of fun. And um, you can find me at nishadalgren.com. And I forgot to mention that we're having a four week workshop starting in, for those of you in Los Angeles, it will be in Pasadena um, starting, I think, on November. 12th, there's a, there's a free sort of video call on the 5th of November to let you know what it's going to be, but you can find under the workshops tab on my website, and it'll be a combination of Hakomi therapy and uh, dynamic eating psychology, and I'm doing it with a certified Hakomi therapist, Timothy Tillman. So, um, and again, thanks for letting me be on tonight. It was really fun. Thanks, Sarah C., for talking to Frank. Yeah, I was going to say, I, um, you know, I didn't know you, obviously, um, prior to Sarah C. Um, recommending that you came on, and I, I always want to make sure that our panelists and our special guests are people who are educated, who are smart, who, um, who are going to give the best advice for our viewers. It is extremely important to me that our viewers only get the right information and the best information and um, you know because Sarah C brought, you know said that you should be here um, I completely trust and know that Sarah C is one of the smartest so uh, I was glad to have you on and like I said I really hope that you'll come back at another time um, to be a panelist again because uh, you really for sure a lot. 
great. And for the ever so lovely and the greatest Sarah R. <laughs> the greatest Sarah R. <laughs> <laughs> you are the greatest I... Sarah R that I know. Probably because I'm the only one you know. Bingo. So mean. <laughs> all right, everyone. I just wanted to say good night to you all and thank you all for watching because if it weren't for you, we would just be sitting here talking to ourselves. And as much fun as that is, we really like that you guys tune in and watch us every month and that we have such an interactive community and we get to talk back to you. I, I really appreciate it and I just want you to know that. You know, I get it. If you're feeling alone in this world and um, IBD can be so tough and so lonely that there is a bunch of us out there that get it and you're not alone tonight or ever. Um, you can find me again at inflamedanduntamed.com which is written right there underneath my name. Oh, look at me. I can point. Don't judge my bad nail polish on that finger. Um, but y'all have a good night. I just said y'all because I speak like Christina now. And, um, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. you got to draw it out. It's got to oh, be that I'm sorry. draw. Yeah. I hope y'all have a good night. Hey, I'm starting to, I'm going to be suing y'all for harassment. So. <laughs> Bye, everyone. And the lovely Sarah C. I'm not going to get sued. I didn't say anything. Um, so I want to say thank you, everyone, for attending, especially this roundtable. I was very excited to have Misha come on board. Um, and I hope that you guys took a lot of love and ideas from this to explore more. I think this is what we do here on the roundtable. We give a little to hopefully encourage you to explore more. Um, and so I'm the founder and CEO of the Crohn's Journey Foundation. You can find me at thecrohnsjourneyfoundation.org and up on top are all the social media links. And we are working hard and I'm going to be bugging Frank a lot soon and Christina as well to find a location on the East Coast so we can officially set the day and start the ball moving. So yay for that. And um, we basically host retreats to help find a peace between mind, body, and soul and to really combine an east and west approach to treating yourself. So that's what I do. And Frank, thanks for having me. And Marissa, I'm so happy you came and joined us. I'm so happy to hey, be here. Thank you for having me, guys. Love you, Nisha. I'll talk to you after. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys so much once again. Um, and we'll see you, of course, next month for another episode of the IBD Roundtable. Good night. Bye, Bye everyone.